it's, it's important, you know, if God didn't specifically prohibit something, that we don't prohibit it ourselves. We can have a preference, we can have a, you know, understanding, but I think it's always uh, uh, questionable. And we're going to make a blanket prohibition for something that, again, uh, we're, we're pulling an extrapolation. And it, it does remind me of 5679, where it says, none can grasp this except the uh, sincere. That people say, oh, no, this is a commandment. And, you know, if you're menstruating, you shouldn't be touching the, the Quran. I kind of see it in that same way. Like, there are certain things that God put in the Quran that are open for uh, our own discretion. Be nice, uh, sorry, dress nice and be clean when you go to the masjid is one of those examples. You know, where God didn't put specifics like, oh, you got to, you know, uh, do this specific bathing ritual and wear these specific clothes. He left it to us. I see the same way where it says uh, you may enjoy this privilege uh, in the manner, all right, that uh, um, however you like. This is between, you know, the couple that these are uh, private times. They can decide what they're comfortable with. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be uh, making religious decrees, again, unless God specifically uh, made these in the, the Quran. Honestly, like I agree with Peter and Rashad on this one. Like I think it's it's both. We can't make a decree, but at the same time, it is recommended. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if anyone, if no one else has any comments on this topic, uh, we can continue. I guess. <clears throat> any any other questions? I'll just keep going. Okay. Okay, so this this next batch, this is the fun stuff. We're getting into like laws of divorce and all kinds of like nitty gritty kind of details. All right, do we have a volunteer to read from two two four? I can read. <clears throat> yeah, go for it. It's too bad. I don't... Okay, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, a subtitle: Do not take God's name in vain. Do not subject God's name to your casual swearing that you may appear righteous, pious, or to attain credibility among the people. God is here, knower. God does not hold you responsible for the mere utterance of oaths. He holds you responsible for your innermost intentions. God is forgiver, clement. Uh, subtitle, Laws of Divorce. Those who intend to divorce their wives shall wait four months. Cooling off. If they change their minds and reconcile, then God is forgiver, merciful. If they go through with the divorce, then God is hearer, knower. The divorced woman shall wait three menstruations before marrying another man. It is not lawful for them to conceal what God creates in their wombs, if they believe in God in the last day. In case of pregnancy, the husband's wishes shall supersede the wife's wishes, if he wants to remarry her. The women have rights as well as obligations equitably. Thus, the man's wishes prevail in case of pregnancy. God is almighty, most wise. Divorce, shall, divorce may be retracted twice. The divorced woman shall be allowed to live in the same home amicably or leave it amicably. It is not lawful for the husband to take back anything he had given her. However, the couple may fear that they may transgress God's law. If there is fear that they may transgress God's law, they commit no error if the wife willingly gives back whatever she chooses. These are God's laws. Do not transgress them. Those who transgress God's laws are the unjust. Uh... There were some things in parentheses. I don't know if I should have read them, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, you should, because it's really important. So uh, the, in 226, <clears throat> it says the, their wives shall wait four months. This is those who intend to divorce their wives shall wait four months. That's cooling off. That's what we know. And then also 228, the divorced woman shall wait three menstruations before marrying another man. Um, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Menstruations for what? And then it says in the case of pregnancy, the the husband's wishes shall supersede the wife's wishes. Thus the man's wishes prevail in case of pregnancy. So it's worth pointing out the the aspect of the parentheses are just for a clarification, um, because sometimes like in the uh, the Arabic, there are certain, um, how do you put it, contexts that's uh, there or in conjunction with uh, other verses in some other uh, um, uh, instances. It's just to kind of, uh, yeah, uh, give a uh, shed light on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the verse. Can I give an example of this? So in chapter 30, Verse 32, it says, do not fall in idol worship, 
like those who divide the religion into sects, right? So the idea is if you just look at the verse and say, oh, well, uh, you know, this verse, the, it's, the parentheses is not appropriate. But when you read the previous verse, you find out that, well, the context is, is, um, <clears throat> is idol worship. So it's related. And so I think a lot of times what the parentheses, the function they serve is, look, it's telling us what the verse is saying, like kind of what Peter is saying, using circumstantial evidence or context or grammar or idioms or something like that. But it's not literally, uh, you know, spelled out in the Arabic Quran, but that's the implication of what is uh, in the verse. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so otherwise, uh, like 3032 doesn't make sense, right? Because it, it says, do not ever fall into idol worship. And then the next verse says, like those who divide the religion. But if you just read that verse in isolation, you wouldn't know. So that's why the parentheses serves that function. Yeah. But I just want to make a general comment. Uh, I feel like we're all here because we want to be here and we're studying the word of God. And, you know, if if someone comes here and you know they don't like studying the word of god i don't know i, I feel like that's a problem we don't we're here because we enjoy studying the word of god and it's not boring for us we it, it's it, we're fulfilling a commandment and it's a pleasure for us and we get closer to god so uh, you know I, i'm just really thankful to have this opportunity and i'm very thankful that everyone else uh you know that's here shares this perspective i appreciate that We talk about the uh, the 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 verses as far as the uh, divorce. Actually, uh, we didn't talk two 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 four. Subject: God's name to your casual uh, swearing. Interesting. There was a you know people come on the server and they're uh, uh, arguing and getting rowdy. They constantly is like uh, um, are invoking uh, God's name in every comment or phrase and stuff that they're uh, saying. I just see it in that aspect that it's like, especially when their actions aren't, <laughs> are not like nice. It's just, it, it's really putting, you know, God's name in a bad light. Like if I'm, uh, you know, cursing someone and I'm constantly invoking someone, uh, God's name uh, as I'm doing it, it's like, uh, I'm using, uh, the, the name of God as a, a bludgeon to kind of like strengthen my, my argument, which again, I don't, I don't think that's a, uh, a righteous, uh, approach. I have a question for 229. Can I ask? Of course. Uh, it says, um, if, the, if there is fear that they may transgress God's law, I just wanted to know, like, uh, what does that mean? Like, how, in what way could there be fear of, uh, like, a risk of transgressing God's law in this situation? You divorce, you live with your husband in the same house. You might have sex and intercourse. You used to be doing it all the time. Now you divorce. It's prohibited oh. between the two. No, because I, I think it says like if there's um it says if there is fear that they may transgress God's law, they commit no error if the wife willingly gives back whatever she chooses. So I thought it was talking about like a like giving back uh, uh taking back things the husband gave or something like that. So in that situation, what where would what will be the risk of transgressing God's law? Maybe you stayed before because you you are in a situation where uh, you're discussing something that you owe or she owes. I don't know, but uh, clearly, do you transgress God's law when you stay with your ex-husband? Could you? Could you be transgressing, just staying with him in the same house? I mean, what is most tempting? You cannot exclude that. You cannot exclude the fact that you are tempted to be sleeping with your husband, with your ex-husband. No? Is that Mustafa? I said it's certainly a possibility, right? Yeah. 
I mean, I do see what Taba is saying. You know, what's uh, in the question? Like, what's the connection with giving back uh, something? So it it seems like it's in relation to uh, uh, some possessions, right? Uh, that each a uh, a couple is uh, holding on to. Um, how that could be a transgression. Uh, one thought is that aspect of, you know, taking more than what is due to you. I could see that as a uh, possibility in the sense where someone feels like, oh, no, I've been wrong, so I'm just going to take, you know, uh, this and this and this and, um, you know, beyond what their uh, th their right uh, is to. You see this actually happen a lot where, you know, the couple, irrespective of uh, being submitters or God's law, they just want to get the upper hand. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Hello? Because I kind of, um, I kind of, like, I'm reading it like, uh, the divorce, it's not lawful for the husband to take back anything he had given her, but the couple may fear, like, of, like, transgressing god's law and if that fear is there then there's no error if the wife willingly gives back whatever she chooses um i was like paraphrasing so um like is it about like uh, mm, like the wife keeping things and like there's like a risk by her keeping things she might be transgressing some kind of uh, um uh, fall into transgressing um by keeping the possessions I don't think so. Like what was given to her is rightfully hers to keep. That's why it's up to her whether she wants to give it back or not. So yeah, that's but, why I was asking. Like, where is the risk of transgressing God's law? Uh, the uh, the verse and the verse saying that in case the wife get caught committing adultery, the husband might keep some of the stuff, right? Yeah, as far as I right. know, like in case of adultery, I don't know if she gets anything, honestly. I'm not sure. Yeah. Now let's say sometimes there's a doubt, right? People might divorce in a doubt. You know, did she commit it? Like if you if you caught your wife in some kind of acts, and you don't have witnesses, and you swore, and she swore, and and I think of the situation of you know um, no one knows really what happened and you end up divorcing her but she did something might not be adultery but it's something that she shouldn't be doing I could also see it in the sense where things can escalate really uh, quickly where let's say for instance the 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 wife says oh this is you know mine and let's say she has a right to it and then the uh, husband retaliates and says okay well if you're going to do that then you know uh he does something on his end says well okay this is mine you got to you know get out of the house whatever and um very quickly it just kind of uh, blows up i could see that as a uh, possible um uh case of uh this first being uh, uh describing okay I just so I can like recap on this. Okay, so essentially, if you married her and consummated, she can keep whatever you gave her. If you married her and didn't touch her, then she can keep half. Uh, if you married her and she committed adultery, then she gets nothing. Would you say that's correct? If she commits adultery, she gets nothing. Which verse that that um, did you get that from? That if uh, she commits adultery, I'm trying to uh, remember. But uh, which do you do you recall off the top of your head? No, I don't recall. That's what I'm asking you. Okay, it does talk about that. It's basically the the couple that's resp the the side that's responsible for the divorce that they have uh, stipulations. And yeah, there are specific ones for adultery. I just don't recall off the top of my head. Uh, I'd have to look at the verses again.
Mm. Okay, so let's keep going. So <clears throat> we talked about casual swearing, 224, uh, mere utterance of oaths, 225, laws of divorce, the four months, and then <clears throat> the divorced woman shall wait three menstruations before marrying another man. What about the divorced wife? I'm sorry, the divorced husband. How long does the husband have to wait before marrying another woman? What do you guys think? After the four months, you don't have to wait three months. You can get married right away. Two twenty-six, right? Yeah, you both have to do four months cooling off. And then once the divorce is finalized, she needs to wait three months. You can get married right away. I see it the, the same way. That's why the that's why okay. that's why the verse is that's why it's simple it's a little weird the way it was those who intend intend in the verse. Yeah, it's only an intention. That's why it says if they decide to go through with it after four months, mm -hmm. so they haven't actually went through with it, and they can't go through with it unless they do the four months interim. And God says to measure that in term precisely and do not tra transgress God's laws. Uh, and, it, and sometimes it's like a weird in term, like for the, the widow, it's four months, 10 days. Like, and she needs to wait every, every last day. Mm. Okay. Uh, any other questions about these verses, or are we good on them? I have a question about two twenty-five. Um, what does it mean, like, uh, like God does not hold you responsible for the mere utterance of oaths? He holds you responsible for your innermost intentions. Like, what does mere utterance of oaths mean? Oh, something light. Something you do. Something like uh, I don't know. If you, if you cook me some, if you make some good food today, I might, I will. I don't know. I will buy you some kind of stuff that you needed, that that you that you asked for. If you don't really mean to to buy, you just want to eat some good food. <laughs> She cooked you some good food. I don't know. Uh, I think the emphasis is on the utterance of, of the things you say. It's like, yes, we are supposed to be responsible for what we say, but also if, we, uh, if we're forced by circumstance or if we just casually say something, that, that's not necessarily our truest intentions. So we don't use God's name casually. I think that's really important. Um. I have like a different, unique way on it. Uh, essentially, like there's not a specific way that you need to utter that promise. It's more like, like you don't have to say, I swear by God, I'm going to do this. If you give somebody your like legitimate word and you intend, your intentions are coming into this now, to keep that word and then you end up breaking it, that's an oath broken. So it's not necessarily you have to swear by God that that would make you not violate an oath. Right, which is fasting three days. If I could add to that, what I would say is, you know, one of the things that you hope as we become like more devout to this religion is that when we say we're going to do something, we actually mean it, right? We don't, uh, this is like a bad um, habit that's happened to a lot of people that they use the word inshallah as in a maybe, you know, hey, you're going to come tomorrow, inshallah. Like, you know, it's not yes. Uh, and that's the way it should be. If you're going to say you're going to do something, that you try your utmost to uphold it. Um, and I think that that's like, it's one of these things where it's like a verse where God is kind of making it easy in the sense where like, look, he holds you responsible for your actual intentions. But the, the, the grander kind of uh, implication, as Mustafa mentioned, is in 589. That, you know, when we use, uh, we make uh, a promise, in essence, uh, that we invoke, you know, God's name on it. But um, we, we take it seriously. We don't just, you know, um, get lightly in that sense. 
because this is one of the, the reasons that it says God uh, is described as hating divorce is because when we divorce, we're basically breaking a, a, a very solemn oath that we made. Um, so, you know, these are the kind of stuff that in essence, that when a, a submitter, a believer makes a, a promise, we try our utmost to uphold that promise. Okay. Some, inter some interesting okay. verses, though. 1691, you shall fulfill your covenant with God when you make such a covenant. You shall not violate the oaths after swearing by God to carry them out. For you have made God a guarantor for you. God knows everything you do. But do not be like the knitter who unravels her strong knitting into piles of flimsy yarn. This is your example. If you abuse the oaths to take advantage of one another, whether one group is larger than the other, God thus puts you to the test surely show you on the day of resurrection everything you had disputed and 589 god does not hold you responsible for the mere utterance of oaths he holds you responsible for your actual intentions if you violate an oath you shall atone by feeding 10 poor people from the same food you offer to your own family or clothing them or freeing a slave if you cannot afford this then you shall fast three days this is the atonement for violating the oaths you swore to keep Shall fulfill your oaths. God thus explains his revelations to you that you may be appreciative. I want to add to that, like, it lists the requirements of, like, clothing somebody or feeding somebody. Like, if you couldn't do that, then you fast three days. Like, it's actually better to do the aforementioned things than to fast. Mm. It's just creating a, a caveat where anyone can, you know, inshallah, be able to fulfill this. You know, if you're so if you're so tight on budget that you can't afford to feed, you can always afford not to eat. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, out of God's mercy. You think about this: if we genuinely did this, like let's say you took it serious, that any time I say I'm going to do something, if I fail, I'm going to feed t uh, ten poor people. You know, you'd be a lot more. You'd have a lot more integrity in your life. You'd be identified as someone who's like, oh no, you know. Uh, Mustafa, Cho, uh, uh, Navid, whoever, these are people who uphold their word because they know that it's like, look, if, if I break my word to you, I'm really breaking my word to God. And uh, it's just, it's a mechanism for us to really, a lot of weight, we say we're going to do something. Um, I think this is like a very strong trait for uh, uh, believers. You know, we, we take our word very seriously. You guys know what the Mandela effect is? That you think you remember things, but you actually didn't. They're not even real in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, there's ones where Shazam uh, was Will Smith as opposed to Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, you can look it up all the list of things. Um, Berenstein Bears were actually the the. It's a. Weinstein Bears? It, it's just oh, like there's there's no wait, wait wait there's no such movie as Shazam. That's literally yeah, the Shazam. Mandela effect. Yeah. Wait no, there is one in 2019, but not like there's a childhood one. Fun, Shazam, yeah. I just yeah. felt like I just had the Mandela effect because I swear, if you asked me 589, um, that the first requirement was to uh, f uh, fast three days. Mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> any other questions or comments regarding what we read or other verses? Is there any questions about any other verses that anyone has? We can open it up to other verses of the Quran. We got a, a general this this feeding of uh, poor people. I'm curious, like, how do you guys understand that? So way I've been doing it, um, and I don't know if this is correct, there's a, a food bank in uh, the where I live that they feed basically families. Um, and you give them money and then they basically uh, provide meals to, uh, to families on, uh, you know, the, your behalf. Is that suitable or is it something that in essence, like, no, I got to go and you know, physically find 10 people to, uh, to, to feed myself? Like, um, I'm curious what you guys think.
So they have a program where they feed people? Yeah, it's, it's a food bank. Basically, they say, look, for each, uh, you know, X number of dollars you give, these are how many meals they can provide. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I think, I think this is kind of like the Zakat thing. I feel like you have to pers like personally work attach to someone. Sorry, just, it doesn't work because you have to feed them from what you feed your family. Do you have to? Yeah, you ha it has to be something you're willing to eat. Yeah. You don't go to the food bank to eat. Wouldn't be opposed to it. Just saying. I mean, the food they got is it's it's good quality. You know, mashallah, it's it's good quality food. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I hear you. Let me let me pull up that verse where it says, "From the food you eat." Or the one you feed your family. You just read it. I don't know. But yeah, even um. Like they you're, say, you're right. You're, yeah, it, it is in five eighty nine. Says from the food you offer to your own family. Good point. No much Yeah. So if you violate an oath, you shall atone by feeding ten poor people from the same food you offer to your own family. So let's say I get in and out for my own family, then I can just buy in and out for them, right? Yeah. If the, if if you if you are living by yourself and all you eat is like McDonald's, you can give them McDonald's. Okay. Like does it. Like, but it has to be something you are willing to feed yourself and your family. Um, you know those type of situations where you, uh, you eat things uh, that you know are bad for you, but you just eat it because of your own like uh, you like eating it because it tastes good, but you know it's bad for you. So, for example, let's say something unhealthy, some junk food, you. You would you would eat it because it's good, it's yummy to you, but you know it's bad for you. So, like, could you give like unhealthy food to other people in that case? Uh, do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you wouldn't eat it if it wasn't uh, yummy because you know it's bad for your health. Yeah, I don't think you have. You can only yeah. It's kind of like saying like we have to give like organic people organic food to people right but um for shahida's question i think you can give food long distance like you can you can have someone give someone to in bangladesh but it doesn't have to be in your like your neighborhood like you can do it you can have it accommodated to facilitate feeding someone in a different country i think that's okay because we do that for zakat also right i don't think there's anything wrong with that to be honest yeah, that's fine. I think like you can stretch it more, especially if you're sending like food to Africa. As long as the food is equal to the quality that the rest of the people there are eating, I think it would count. God knows best. Yeah, that's a. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I personally, because I agree with Shahida that the hungry people are much different in other countries than here. Here, like Peter's talking about the food pantry and stuff. Food bank, food pantry. There's a lot of programs, to be honest with you. That's not even taking into consideration food stamps and many other programs, churches, so many programs like feed people. So it's just different in my view uh, here to other places, but that doesn't mean you can't find anyone. I'm sure you can find somebody eventually. But anyway, that's about an oath. My question is, how do you make an oath to then have to feed people? How do you make an oath based on that verse? Just, just essentially making a promise. It tells you it's not about the utterances. It's not what you say. It's your intention to, to uphold something, right? As a believer, and you know God is witnessing you. So can I say I make an oath to stop smoking? Uh, no, that's a stupid list. But in all honesty, though, it, it does it work. This is proven that it works. That if you put a, an incentive in the sense of saying, look, if I'm going to, uh, you know, slip, that I have a price that I pay, uh, it does serve as a uh, reinforcement to uphold your oath. 
So, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, bad per se. But it's one of those things that it's like, yeah, you could you could use that as a mechanism to try to uh, uphold, you know, um, certain conduct if, if you're willing to, to make that oath to God. Yeah, I don't understand Mustafa's position. You're saying that it's stupid if I do yeah. this mechanism yeah. to stop smoking? Yeah, but you're getting, that's not even an oath that you know you're not going to violate. You know how many people swore off smoking and went smoking the next day? Like, it's not, you shouldn't be doing, setting up yourself to fail like that with an oath that you may or may not keep. You don't know. You just really feel strongly about it now. Another uh, mechanism is basically people set up. Uh, so one of the challenges for uh, doing something like this is someone feels good. They say, oh, okay, well, I, I smoked, but I fed 10 poor people. So it's a, it's a net positive, right? <laughs> Uh, is you can basically set up a system where you're going to say, look, like, let's say if you're a Republican, you're going to donate to the Democratic Party or you're a Democrat, you're going to donate to the Republican Party uh, if you, you know, fail in this uh, uh, task that you give yourself. It's like another uh, mechanism that, you know, you could try utilizing if you really want to uh, <laughs> create a negative, uh, negative, uh, 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 what's the word? Um, yeah, you know, but you have to understand, understand. like, Sorry, like, but breaking an oath is something bad. That's why it's punishable by the days of fasting or the people you need to feed. Um, making an oath like that, you know, a smoker, let me tell you, as an ex-smoker, okay, I'll have no problem feeding 10, 20 people to get back to smoking, okay? But guess what? Now I have a negative incentive to quit again. Especially using something like an oath. It kind of reminds me of a Friday uh, prayer when we uh, repent. You know, we're, we're repenting to God for these uh, sins. Realistically, it's not like we're going to stop committing sins after that. But, you know, we do try our utmost not to. What about that one person that doesn't repent during... Uh... Repentance. <laughs> like sins. Do you believe all sins that you repent for uh, and reform, you they get credited as hasanat? If you reform, yeah. So it just yeah. for people that they they get transformed into credits, good deeds. Um, no, no, no. Like, let's say me, I'm as, as a submitting, believing, God-fearing man. Tonight, for whatever reason, I do zina. Okay. Tomorrow, I sincerely repent. Right. And do I get that as good deeds now? So, I am I getting like rewarded for negative behavior? This is one of my beliefs. Is I don't think if you were genuinely righteous, God would allow you to co commit zina. Um, we, we have this example in the, uh, the Quran that uh, when the uh, uh, hypocrites were basically to fight, that they turned around and fled and says, this is reflective of some of the evil deeds that they committed. It, like someone who commits, you know, uh, uh, adultery. It's not like they made one bad decision and they just slipped, right? It's like, no, this was a consecutive line of bad decisions that propelled them into committing that act. This is like the mistake that uh, Joseph's brothers made. This is the mistake that the uh, people of Sala made. They said, oh, afterwards we will be righteous. In that, It's like, look, when you do something of that heinous, that magnitude, you're going to suffer severe consequences for it. You know? And if you look at the example of Joseph's brothers, who I do believe were redeemed, you know, how many years did they have to suffer for that bad decision? And it's not like it's one of those things, that's our... Um, to think like, okay, I'm just going to commit this like totally horrendous uh, act and then I'm going to be good. You know, it's like we, we, we think we're kind of like uh, found a, a caveat around God's system. But God, it's like God has already accounted for that. The fact that if, you know, uh, God allowed someone to get to that level of sinful behavior, there's probably a lot more underneath that has to be uh, uh, fleshed out before they can get back to being righteous. The likeliness of them, you know, committing such a bad act and then waking up is just like, no, you know, at that point, there's probably so many underlying foundational issues with that individual's faith that needs to be fixed. 
it's going to be, you know, years, decades potentially before uh, they can be back to a status of, uh, you know, genuinely being reformed. I can respect that. But I think, like, to me, okay, in reality, uh, it's that's not what ends up happening. The believer doesn't end up going, oh, I'm just going to do this tonight, and then I'm going to repent tomorrow. That's not how it goes. Okay, if you look back at every little slip up in your life, you'll know that's not how you made it. Okay, you'd and be surprised, bro. You would be surprised. I'm not. I'm sure I won't be surprised, but like for the majority of true, sincere, believing people, but that's not how we fall into sin. We do not fall into sin by allowing it on ourselves. We we completely ignore it. We forget in that moment. God is even looking. Okay. And that's the truth of it. It's not about oh I'll do this and and you you just you know you're gonna really feel guilty and sorry about whatever you did whether you stole or whatever it is honestly, okay, uh, told a lie, deceived somebody, broken oath. I don't know, but in the end, you do fall into it. But where's the regret now? There is no regret because you just repent and then you get rewarded for your sin. And in the end, you don't feel guilty for anything you've ever done. And that reduces your resistance to falling into the next sin. Because the last time, the last sin left a good taste in your mouth. Because it honestly increased your rewards. I think this is, you know, one of the mechanisms that Satan uses to, to lead people astray. Uh, and, you know, God allows people to reach their potential of belief and disbelief. Meaning that if there's more sin in that person, they're not going to taste the retribution just yet. And they're going to be given more rope. Go further down the next path and further down the next path. Like take the example of, again, adultery. It's not like adultery happens, again, just like on, on a whim. It's like, no, the person first made the decision to, you know, let's say have that conversation. Made the decision to engage, continue the engagement. They made the decision to meet up for coffee. They made the de decision to, you know, continue the uh, communication. They made the decision to get the hotel room. They made the decision to uh, meet up. Like all these, you know, multitude of bad decisions until that act was committed. You know, and you think about everything that even led up to that point. You know, um, and for me, it's it's the the. The fallacy is to think that it was, oh, just this one decision. It's like, no, dude, you spent this entire time, in essence, corroding and deteriorating the integrity of your soul. To think that all of a sudden, oh, you you know, you know fell off the, the edge, and then you're like, okay, now I repent. It's like you still got to go back and repair all that, you know, uh, that damage you've done. Imagine, like, say, for instance, again, you have a car. And you're, you're driving off the Rockies, and then eventually, you, you know, you, t you take it off a cliff. Um, it's not just going to be repaired in one go. It's like you have to kind of like fix everything that goes into that. And I kind of see the the soul in the same ways. We we have this misconception that it's like, oh, you know, I just I was doing everything perfect, and then boom, I committed adultery. It's like, no, no, no. I can guarantee that if you got to that level of sin, there's probably a multitude of things that you were doing wrong prior to that that allowed you to get to that point. Can you I push you back on that though? Yeah. yeah. So. I just have, I agree with the general premise that you're uh, presenting, but I do have, I can, I just want to push back. So for example, Joseph also committed it, but he also, he almost committed adultery, but he didn't make a de chain of wrong decisions. So how would you describe that? Even, okay. So take for instance, like uh, Joseph, it's this aspect that he was stopped before he got to that act. But I could say, and it, this is speculation, that there's a multitude of things that he could have done not to have been in that situation. God protected him. And you could say part of it is the fact that, again, he was young, you know, naive, uh, this and that. But I think it's like, again, a lot of this does come with, with age. You know, someone who doesn't know better is going to uh, be less liable than someone who does. And same thing, for instance, like uh, you take the example of, a, you know, a teenager uh, versus like an adult who's married. I wouldn't put as much responsibility on the teenager as I would as the adult who's married. But even then, there's some bearing of responsibility there.
It's a good point. I mean, it's definitely a good point. Also, to to that is the fact that God prevented him from committing the act, right? Uh, if he didn't, you know, if let's say, for instance, again, you take someone who actually committed the act, you know, I could say with a fair amount of uh, certainty that it wasn't just, you know, the, again, they were a perfect submitter. And then one moment they just like totally slipped. Like, no, there, there must have been a multitude of things that occurred uh, prior to that, that led them to that decision. Similar to the, uh, I put the verse in 3155. Surely those among you who turn back the day the two armies clash have been duped by the devil. This reflects some of the evil works they had committed. God has pardoned them, God has forgiven Clement. Meaning like, them turning back was not the, that was not the sin that they committed. This was a reflection of the sins they committed in the past. They weren't able to face their, uh, you know, uh, the other army uh, during the battle. All right. <clears throat> Does anyone have any other questions? You can either come up and ask a question or you can type it in the VC1 chat. <clears throat> Today we read verses in um, chapter 2, uh, verse 221, I believe to two, 228, something like that. Actually, it would be good to take note. Um, <clears throat> we, we read to 2.30. No, actually, no. I'm not sure where we read to. I would have to check. Um, I had, oh, I, I saw Diogo's verse. I wanted to read it. Attributes of, attributes of the righteous. Hey, put this one. If they fall in sin or wrong their souls, they remember God and ask for ask forgiveness for their sins. And who forgives the sins except God? And they do not persins, persist in sins knowingly. So my understanding was that the righteous uh, do not persist in sins knowingly. So it's very important to identify what are sins. There is another one that kind of goes hand in hand in this. That's the attributes of the believers. It's uh, 53.32. Um, actually, this is the righteous, to be honest with you. So here we go. Um, so they don't commit sins persistently. And it says they avoid gross sins and transgressions except for minor offenses. So maybe once in a while they'll say a white lie. Or, I don't know, do another minor offense, I guess. I don't know. What do you guys think that about language. this? Angry. Uh, I don't know. I feel like we should get to a point where we stop getting angry because that's, like, foundational. Do you, do you disagree? I mean, the the end objective, but uh, at the same time, I, I don't think, you know, someone losing their uh, patience uh, is in the same caliber of, you know, someone who commits adultery. I wouldn't consider the, uh, the, the act of losing patience in itself a, uh, a gross sin. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I would just comment on the bad language. I feel like a believer wouldn't repeatedly be using bad language. It's worth identifying, you know, what are the uh, the the gross sins according to the Quran. You know, idol worship is obviously the it's awesome. Um, you know, idol worship is the uh, the the mother of all sins. It's like the the grossest sins. Um, So gr gross offenses, huh? <clears throat> hey, hey, just thinking out loud, it's, you know, there's a distinction between things that happen in like, you know, the heat of the moment where, uh, in essence, you're not planning, you're not entertaining. It's just like all of a sudden, yeah, someone cuts you off and then you, you, you know, <laughs> for a moment you honk the horn and you, uh, uh, you know, get upset. 
is like different than um you know someone who's uh going out of their way in essence to uh to 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 live a um you put it like a a, a distasteful um you know sinful life so we have this concept in criminal law it's called heat of passion crime and basically it's someone that does something uh an intensely emotional state of mind induced by a type of provocation that would cause a reasonable person to act or impulse without reflection. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like this is very generous in the legal world and in the criminal law world. It's very generous because you can get away with stuff. You know, the question is, was there with the intention of malintent? I think adultery is like an interesting one because, again, it's, it's one of these things that someone... It's not like it just happened in the moment, you know, more often than not, it's going to be a series so, of terrible, bad decisions that lead someone to, to commit that. Okay, but yeah, but what about the reverse? So, for example, you catch your spouse committing adultery and then you beat up the guy. See, I, that's something that, again, if you didn't see coming, it's like I, I see that as the the um, uh, which more it's a yeah, heat of a, a passion crime rather than, you know, the, the, the spouse that committed the act. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. I, I see a minor offense, a little, a little more minor than that. For example, you say, "Oh, tomorrow I'm going to do this," but you forgot to say "inshallah" or something like that. Hmm. So you see minor offenses as like very minor, huh? Yeah. I mean, I guess you could kind of make it more flexible, which should be minor, though. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds. Well, I don't know about minor. I, I think it's just like there's sins and there's there's gross sins, and I'm, there's nothing minor about any of them. What's well, interesting, the verse distinguishes between gross sins, transgressions, and then minor offenses. I, I think of transgressions in the sense where it's like you know you have a certain right, you exceed that limit. Um, you know that's a transgression. Uh, gross sin is something that again it's like black and white. And then minor offenses or slip ups, in essence. So the Arabic is al lamama. Let me pull it up. So those are minor offenses. It only occurs, the root only occurs twice in the Quran. It's the but other Anyway, other. yeah, 89 and 19 is the other one. But, um, but this one, it is minor offense. Like one mm. of the legit meanings is minor offense. So, uh, so I mean, Mustafa, how would you translate this verse then? Because minor offense is minor offense, right? Which verse? Where does it say minor offense? I put it in the VC1 chat. 53, 32. Yeah, 53, 32. Interesting, yeah. If you look at uh eighty nine nineteen, it's like in a, one of the uh, the meanings of the uh, root is to occasionally stumble. But what's interesting is what he uh, what's translated as uh, transgressions is a uh, fawashi. Uh, this is like a sexual immorality. Typically, it's used towards that. This isn't like uh, these aren't like minor uh, transgressions. These are like pretty uh, pretty major. So how are you relating it in eighty nine nineteen? I'm not seeing it. Yeah, it's it's well the word has a uh, the root has multi meaning. Um, one is again like stumbling, a minor offense. The other one is the the sense of uh, collect, to amass, to uh, to be greedy. Um, yeah, but where is that word in the, in the, like what, and like how is that being translated? So it says, uh, and you all consume the inheritance, uh, devouring wholly, indiscriminately, or greedily. So, yeah, okay.
All right. Any other questions or comments? So, did we talk about fasting? So currently it's Ramadan, for those of you unaware. <clears throat> this is the month that we fast. And the fasting goes from dawn to sunset. <clears throat> Some people think it's sunrise to sunset, but that's wrong. It's actually dawn to sunset. Uh, yeah. And if you're in the United States, it's 29 days. If you're in other locations, uh, it's 30 days. Peter, can you explain if you are familiar or someone else is familiar with when Ramadan starts? So this someone is a discussion. Asked, so yeah. someone asked me this uh, um, in an email yesterday. I'm just my the same response. They're in the uh, the East Coast. So the way you, you determine when Ramadan starts is based on the new moon. So the new moon is going to be universal, uh, irrespective of where you are on the earth. And so uh, the Ramadan starts, the new moon, it starts on uh, April 1st, 2022 at 6.24 a.m. Uh, UTC. So what you do is you basically convert that to your time zone. If that's before sunrise, or sorry, before sunset, because Ramadan, the Islamic day starts at the night, and you're going to fast the next day. If it occurs, if the new moon occurs after sunset, you don't fast the next day, but the following day you're going to fast. So if you look at April 1st, 2022, it corresponds to, if I'm not mistaken, like on East Coast time in the U.S., 11.24 uh, p.m. It's after sunset. So since it's after sunset, you're not going to fast on April 1st. You're going to fast on April 2nd. Interesting. Okay, so that's kind of the conclusion we were getting at. So basically, whenever the new moon is, Ramadan starts the following sunset. Is that correct? No, 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 no. So, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, the following sunset. That's where... That's right, the following sunset, if that's when Ramadan starts. Not, 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 no. Um, no. If I say the new moon tonight, like tomorrow is Ramadan. Okay, correct. Like, if it, yeah. Okay. Wait, if when wouldn't before, it be when wouldn't it be the following sunset, Peter? If it's so if the new moon is before sunset where you reside, then you fast the next day. Right. It's no, after, I'm not talking about fasting. I'm not talking about fasting. I'm saying when does Ramadan start? It always starts the following sunset after the new moon. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. And then fasting, you just start the first full day after the start of Ramadan, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. So are we saying that so then okay so the beginning date can be different right yeah i mean it depends on where you live if it's if the new moon is before or after sunset it's going to determine when in essence ramadan starts for you so someone was asking why somebody started fasting on friday so is it is it logically possible for anyone to fast on friday this past friday like uh two days ago Uh, they, they cited the moon. What's that? So they cited the moon, they cited the moon, you know, it's like, how it goes. How would they cited the moon? Before? Yeah, I don't know. It before it exists. You cannot. Yeah, but all I know is like places like Pakistan and things like that, they do fast before us. So. No, they didn't. I don't think or so. After. Let's, I can check. I don't know. But... All I noticed is Half of the Muslims are like a day off than the other half. I don't get it. So right oh. now, in Europe, basically everyone started on the same day, right, for uh, uh, Ramadan. Uh, in Europe, they're going to fast on uh, May 1st, their last day. And then for the U.S., it's uh, April 30th. It's actually, I mean, oh. it's good. Well, I was just going to say, I just checked for Pakistan. They all started on Saturday. So where are you guys saying started on Friday? I haven't seen it for this year. I know previous years. A, yeah, yeah. No, no, but, but this year, we have people on this server that started fasting on Friday. So someone was asking how they calculated that. I think it was just, my guess is they probably just made a mistake. I, I don't think there's any dispute right now, like with, with this year's uh, Ramadan. 
um, with uh, the the dates. Other day, other years there are, and a big part happens where you follow what they see in, like, say, you know, their native country. They they'll fa even though they're residing in the U.S., they'll follow whatever they say in Pakistan or in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, then that's going to create a conflict. Why why is it necessary before or after sunset? Like if I saw the new moon at any point tonight, I can safely assume tomorrow they're not gone. No, 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 no. Because I mean, the day what? starts at sunset. Where's the, the ruling? It, like the day starts from dawn, like that's where Ramadan starts. If you can see the full, if the new moon before the dawn, that's Ramadan. Islamic calendars uh, start at night, right? It's the the lunar calendar. So the first day is actually the first night, if that makes sense. So it's again, if if the new moon occurs before sunset, then that following day you fast. If it occurs after sunset, then the uh, next day you fast. I'm again, I'm just asking where did this ruling come from? This is a, like when you calculate when the 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 run, like the month starts, it's based on the new moon. I mean, that's just like in the night is always what determines the uh, um, the first day of uh, fasting or is the first day of a month in uh, Islamic calendar. I'm just like wondering why the cutoff point at sunset. Like, is it really that clear to even see the moon? Because, well, yeah, because before sunset? No, 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 no. it's not about seeing the moon. It's because the, it on the Islamic calendar. That's when the day starts. That's what I've been trying to say. The day starts at sunset. Although this makes a question for me, Peter. Because then, what about the prayers? It says both. It says, uh, you know what I mean. The five times a day prayer. Because then, how does it work with that? You mean, like the middle prayer? Because if, if, if because if 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 we're gonna say it's a middle prayer, then mm -hmm. doesn't that f distort it if the day starts at sunset? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be the last prayer? Wouldn't Asr be the last prayer if, uh, if the first prayer is Maghrib? The the which mode? The prayers are dictated by the sun, not the the moon. Okay, I understand, but when it says the middle prayer, right? So then it's talking about five prayers consistently, and then there's a middle prayer. Okay. But if I'm, you can pull up the yeah. verse; it would be uh, uh, helpful. I'm looking at the other one regarding the the new moon. Um, pull it up one sec. Yeah. So for Mustafa, the new moon. You have to look at the waxing, it's the waxing crescent, right? So mm -hmm. when you see the waxing crescent, that's the first day of fasting. The new moon is the day before. This is just how a lunar calendar operates. Yeah, no problem. This is the one that's uh, regarding the new moon. Do you think um, like first. on this earth, like the moon phase would be different in Europe than it would be in North America? Uh, it's so again that the the whole world is going to have the the new moon is going to occur the same for everyone anywhere in the world. Um, but uh, as far as yeah, the determination when the the start of the month or the end of the month is, that's where the variation uh, occurs, um, and it's dependent on uh, again the. Uh, 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 when sunset is at that uh, region. What about like in places with no sunset or anything? Yeah, I mean, that's the same thing for like Salat. Like, how do you do Salat if uh, you have six months of uh, no sunset? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got to think of the timing of something else. Like, or I don't think you should not do it. Part of me honestly thinks that's a sign that these are places you shouldn't live. Like it's not designed for human <laughs> habitation. If you it, don't it have to. like, what are you gonna say? No more astronomers. No more go, no, 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 go no, no, no. under unusual circumstances. One, but when you choose to live in a place where, again, six months out of the year it's gonna be night or dark, that these are probably places that aren't uh, conducive mm. for a healthy, uh, uh, you know, uh, for your health. Um, that said, like this is a, a open debate. It's like, yeah, what direction do you face, or how often do you pray when you're on? Uh, what is it? The 
uh, Isis um, orbiting the uh, the Earth. <laughs> yeah. My this is my my two cents. Honest, like I I'm not saying this is a religious decree. I was just thinking about like if I was in that situation, what I would do? I would just align it to a uh, a more suitable uh, geolocation and then just do it per that. I, I kind of constituted strange and unusual circumstances. So just you know, do whatever seems reasonable. <laughs> I remember one time I was on a. If you guys ever fly like um, international and you're going uh, basically uh, with this against the sun or with the sun, it's like dude, you'll be on a plane and literally like every hour or two, it's like a new prayer, which is kind of awkward. And then on the flip side, when you're flying against, like basically with the uh, the same uh, same direction as the uh, orbit of the uh, the Earth, you know, you'll be like 17 hours on a plane, and it's like it's only been one prayer the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> the plane gets tricky. Uh, yeah. I had one time I was flying back from Japan and I had two Fridays and I was wondering, I'm like, do I do Friday prayer again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It's interesting though in uh, uh, 2189 where it talks about the uh, the new moon that it says uh they ask you about the rashad translates the the phases of the moon they, they provide a timing device for the people and determine the time of hajj it's not righteous to beat around the bush righteousness is attained by upholding the commandments and by being straightforward you shall observe god that you may succeed and this is like right after it talks about uh fasting as well in uh 2187 So again, <clears throat> so there's either 29 days of fasting or there's 30 days. And again, it depends on if your first day of fasting is, or if the new moon is before or after uh, sunset. Is that correct, uh, Peter? Yeah, that's the way. Uh, I, I I believe this is like universally understood, but Mustafa does bring like, where did this come from? I I, I don't know. That's the way I always understood it. Was um how it's calculated as far as uh when the first day of a month is for uh, the Islamic calendar and when it ends. So if you go to a lunar calendar, that's just what it is. It's similar to like you know how how they calculate dusk and dawn. Um, you know these are uh, uh, astronomical um, terminations. Yeah, I think I put. Yeah, go ahead. When did the lunar calendar come in, come about? I like, think that's the first that's calendar. The that's the original calendar. No, there's the, the thing is there's always it seems this is my theory, right? When it comes to religious matters, it follows the the lunar calendar, and it actually uses a different word, Amr, right? Um, and then when it has to do with like business and life and these kind of uh, uh, ordeals, it goes by the solar calendar. Um, that's why it says, as far as God is concerned, the number of months is 12, right? Um, this has been God's decree. For whatever reason, when it comes to, like, yeah, religious observations, they follow, and it's the same thing in, like, Judaism. They follow uh, a lunar um, uh, calendar. But then when it comes to, yeah, just, like, you know, day-to-day -day engagements and interactions, it follows the, uh, the solar. Um, I believe it was established after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, right? I don't think so. No, 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 no. no. The lunar calendar predates Muhammad. Uh, Jude, Jude, uh, Judaism, uh, they they added a thirteenth month to it, but um, it's it's based on the lunar calendar as well. That's why, like the the religious uh, ceremonies um, in uh, uh, Judaism, a lot of them they occur uh, at uh, you know sunset. So then what's the difference between a lunar calendar and a loony solar calendar? What's really interesting is there's a person, she's online, I can't remember um, what her uh, YouTube channel is. Years ago, she basically made this video regarding the loony solar uh, calendar, and uh, it got all this traction and buzz. I talked with her, I basically... You know, this is interesting, and then showed her some verses of the Quran um, regarding like the how it uses different terms. 
I went the other week, they linked to her new video. She published it, I guess, a couple of years ago. I didn't, I didn't see it. But uh, she renounced that idea of uh, two, um, uh, the Looney Solar uh, calendar, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And it's, it's a, it's, she did a really good job, like, producing the, uh, the video. It's like, you know, with the animations and the, uh, uh, the voiceover and everything. Can you address this uh, claim regarding um, <clears throat> Ramadan? Because, but it doesn't make sense. So it says, Ahmed just wrote, at the time of the chronic revelation regarding Ramadan, there was no month called Ramadan. It was named later by one of the caliphs from what I've heard. But how is that possible? Because in the Quran, it says the month of Ramadan. So it has to be something that's yeah. identifiable. I agree. This is the month of Ramadan. Says Ramadan is the month during which the Quran was revealed. If it's not identified, then it doesn't it doesn't make sense for it to be identified as Ramadan uh, thirty years later. Yeah, that makes. I agree. 